If you want to find the truth, beauty, and goodness still left in this torn up world of ours, you're going to have to walk a little bit to get it. But the truth, beauty, and goodness of this world have always been found by men who live simply and walk lightly upon the earth. And of such men I shall read Dharma Bums by Jack Kerouac. Hopping a freight out of Los Angeles at high noon one day in late September 1955, I got on a gondola and lay down with my duffel bag under my head and my knees crossed and contemplated the clouds as we rode north to Santa Barbara. It was a local and I intended to sleep on the beach at Santa Barbara that night and catch either another local to San Luis Obispo the next morning or the first class freight all the way to San Francisco at 7 p.m. Somewhere near Camarillo where Charlie Parker had been mad and relaxed back to normal health, a thin old little bum climbed into my gondola as we headed into a siding to give a train right away and looked surprised to see me there. He established himself at the other end of the gondola and lay down facing me with his head on his own miserable small pack and said nothing. By and by they blew the highball whistle after the eastbound freight had smashed through on the main line and we pulled out as the air got colder and fog began to blow from the sea over the warm valley of the coast. Both the little bum and I, after unsuccessful attempts to huddle on the cold steel and wraparounds, got up and paced back and forth and jumped and flapped arms at each other, each our end of the gone. Pretty soon we headed into another siding at a small railroad town and I figured I needed a poor boy of Tokay wine to complete the cold dusk run to Santa Barbara. Will you watch my pack while I run over there and get a bottle of wine? Sure thing! I jumped over the side and ran across Highway 101 to the store and bought, besides wine, a little bread and candy. I ran back to my freight train, which, was, which had another 15 minutes to wait in the now warm, sunny scene. But it was late afternoon and bound to get cold soon. The little bum was sitting cross-legged at his end before a pitiful repast of one can of sardines. I took pity on him and went over and said, How about a little wine to warm you up? Maybe you'd like some bread and cheese with your sardines? Sure thing! He spoke from far away inside a little meek voice box, afraid or unwilling to assert itself. I'd bought the cheese three days ago in Mexico City before the long, cheap bus trip to s across Zacatecas and Durango and Chihuahua, 2,000 long miles to the border at El Paso. He ate the cheese and bread and drank the wine with gusto and gratitude. I was pleased. I reminded myself of the line in the Diamond Sutra that says, Practice charity without holding in mind any conceptions about charity, for charity, after all, is just a word. I was very devout in those days and was practicing my religious devo uh, devotions uh, almost to perfection. Since, since then I've become a little hypocritical about my lip service and a little tired and cynical. Because now I am old, I am grown so old and neutral. But then, then I really believed in the reality of charity and kindness and humility and zeal and neutral tranquility and wisdom and ecstasy. And I believe that I was an old-time bhikkhu in modern clothes, wandering the world, usually the immense triangular arc of New York to Mexico City to San Francisco, in order to turn a wheel of the true meaning, or dharma, and gain merit for myself as a future Buddha or awakener, and as a future hero in paradise. I had not, I had not met Jaffe Ryder yet. I was about to the next week. I had not heard anything about Dharma bums, although at this time I was a perfect Dharma bum myself and considered myself a religious wanderer. The little bum of the gondola solidified all my beliefs by warming up to the wine and talking and finally whipping out a tiny slip of paper which contained a prayer by St. Teresa, announcing that after her death she will return to the earth by showering it with roses from heaven forever for all living creatures. Amen. Where did you get this? I asked. Oh, I cut it out of a reading room magazine in Los Angeles a couple years ago. I always carry it with me. And you squat in boxcars and read it? Most every day. He talked not much more than this, didn't amplify on the subject of St. Teresa, and was very modest about his religion, and told me little about his personal life. He's a kind of thin, quiet little bum nobody pays much attention to, even in Skid Row, let alone Main Street. If a cop hustled him off, he hustled and disappeared, and if yard dicks were around in big city yards, when a freight was pulling out, chances are they never got a sight of the little man hiding in the weeds and hopping on in the shadows. When I told him I was planning to hop the zipper first class freight train the next night, he said, Ah, oh, you mean the midnight ghost? Is that what you call the zipper? You must have been a railroad man on that railroad. 
I was. I was a brake man on the SP. Well, we bums call it the Midnight Ghost because you get on in L.A. and nobody sees you till you get to San Francisco in the morning the thing flies so fast. 80 miles an hour on the straightway, pops. That's right, but it gets mighty cold at night when you're flying up that coast north of Graviote and up around Surf. Surf, that's right. Then the mountains down south of Margarita. Margarita, that's right. But I've read that Midnight Ghost more times than I can count, I guess. How many years been since you've been home? More years I care to count, I guess. Ohio was where I was from. But the train got started, the wind grew cold and foggy again, and we spent the following hour and a half doing everything in our power and willpower not to freeze and chatter teeth too much. I'd huddle and meditate on the warmth, the actual warmth of God, to obviate the cold, and then I'd jump up and flap my arms and legs and sing, but the little bum had more patience than I had and just lay there most of the time, chewing his cud in forlorn, bitter lip thought. My teeth were chattering, my lips blue. By dark we saw with relief the familiar mountains of Santa Barbara taking shape, and soon we'd be stopped and warm in the warm starlight night by the tracks. I bade farewell to the little bum of St. Teresa at the crossing, where we jumped off and went to sleep the night in the sand and the blankets far down the beach at the foot of a cliff where cops wouldn't see me and drive me away. I cooked talk dogs on freshly cut and sharpened sticks over the coals of a big wood fire and heated a can of beans and a can of cheese macaroni in the red-hot hollows and drank my newly bought wine and exulted in one of the most pleasant nights of my life. I waded in the water and dunked a little and stood looking up at the splendorous night sky. Avalokitesh Savara's ten-wondered universe of dark and diamonds. Well, Ray, says I, glad... Only a few miles to go. You've done it again. Happy. Just in my swim shorts, barefooted, wild-haired, in the red fire, dark, singing, swigging wine, spitting, jumping, running. That's the way to live. All alone and free in the soft sands of the beach by the sigh of the sea out there with a ma wink fallopian virgin warm stars reflecting on the outer channel fluid belly waters. And if your cans are red hot and you can't hold them in your hands, just use good old railroad gloves, that's all. I let the food, I let the food cool a little to enjoy more wine and my thoughts. I sat cross-legged in the sand and contemplated my life. Well, there, and what difference did it make? What's going to happen to me up ahead? Then the wine got to work on my taste buds, and before long I had a pitch into those hot dogs, biting them right off the end of the stick, spit, and chomp, chomp, and dig down into the two tasty cans with the old pack spoon, spooning up rich bites of hot beans and pork or a macaroni with sizzling hot sauce, and maybe a little sand thrown in. And how many grains of sand are there on this beach, I think? Well, as many grains of sand as there are stars in the sky, chomp, chomp. And if so, how many human beings have been that... Have there been, in fact, how many living creatures have there been since before the less part of beginningless time? Why, oi, I reckon you would have to calculate the number of grains of sand on this beach and on every star in the sky in every one of the 10,000 great chili cosms, which would be a number of sand, gra sand grains uncomputable by IBM and Burroughs, too. Why, well, boy, I don't rightly know, swig of wine. I don't rightly know, but it must be a couple umpteen trillion sextillion infidel and busted up innumerable number of roses at Sweet St. Teresa and that fine little old man are now this minute showering on your head with lilies. Then, meal done, wiping my lips with my red bandana, I washed up the dishes in the salt sea, kicked a few clods of sand, wandering around, wiped them, put them away, stuck the old spoon back in the salty pack, and lay down curled in my blanket for a night's good and just rest. Waking up in the middle of the night, Wow, where am I? What is the basketball -y game of eternity the girls are playing here by me in the old house of my life? The house isn't on fire, is it? But it's only the banding rush of waves piling up higher, closer, high tide to my blanket bed. I be as hard and old as a conch shell. And I go to sleep and dream that while sleeping I use up three slices of bread breathing. Ah, oh, poor mind of man, and lonely man alone on the beach. And God watching with intense smile, I'd say. And I dreamed of home long ago in New England, my little Kit Kats trying to go a thousand miles following me on the road across America, and my mother with a pack on her back and my father running after the ephemeral, uncatchable train. And I dreamed and woke 
woke up to a gray dawn, saw it, sniffed, because I had seen all the horizon shift as if a scene shifter had hurried to put it back in place and make me believe in its reality, and went back to sleep, turning over. It's all the same thing, I heard my voice say in the void that's highly embraceable during sleep. Chapter 2 the little St. Teresa bum was the first genuine Dharma bum I'd met, and the second was the number one Dharma bum of them all. In fact, it was he, Jafey Ryder, who coined the phrase. Jafey Ryder was a kid from eastern Oregon, brought up in a log cabin deep in the woods with his father and mother and sister, from the beginning of a woods boy, an axeman, farmer, interested in animals and Indian lore, so that when he finally got to college by hook or crook, he was already well equipped for his early studies in anthropology and later in Indian myth and in the actual texts of Indian mythology. Finally, he learned Chinese and Japanese and became an Oriental scholar and discovered the greatest Dharma bums of them all, the Zun lunatics of China and Japan. At the same time, being a Northwest boy with idealistic tendencies, he got interested in old-fashioned IWW anarchism and learned to play the guitar and sing old worker songs to go with his Indian, Indian songs and general folk song interests. I first saw him walking down the street in San Francisco the following week after hitchhiking the rest of the way from Santa Barbara in one long zipping ride given me, as though anybody had believed this, by a beautiful darling young blonde in a snow-white strapless bathing suit and barefooted with a gold bracelet on her ankle, driving a next year's cinnamon red Lincoln Mercury. He wanted visitorine so she could drive all the way to the city, and when I saw I had some in my duffel bag, yelled, Crazy! I saw Jafey loping along in that curious long stride of the mountain climber with a small knapsack on his back filled with books and toothbrushes and whatnot, which was his small going-to-the-city knapsack as part, as apart from his big, full rucksack complete with sleeping bag, poncho, and cook pots. He wore a little goatee, strangely oriental-looking, with his somewhat slanted green eyes, but he didn't look like a bohemian at all and was far from being a bohemian, a hanger owner around the arts. He was wiry, suntanned, vigorous, open, all howdies and glad talk, and even yelling hello to bums on the street, and then asked a question, answered right off the bat from the top or bottom of his mind, I don't know which, and always in a sprightly, sparkling way. Where did you meet Ray Smith? They asked him when he walked into the place, the favorite bar of the Hepcats around the beach, the place. Oh, I always meet my bodhisattvas in the street, he yelled and ordered beers. It was a great night, a historic night in more ways than one. He and some other poets, he also wrote poetry and translated Chinese and Japanese poetry into English, were scheduled to give a poetry reading at the Gallery 6 in town. They were all meeting in the bar and getting high, but as they stood and sat around, I saw that he was the only one who didn't look like a poet, though poet he was indeed. The other poets were either horn-rimmed intellectual hepcats with wild black hair like Alva Goldbook or delicate pale handsome poets like Ike O'Shea, in a suit, or out of this world, genteel-looking Renaissance Italian like Francis de Pavia, who looks like a young priest, or bow-tied, wild-haired, old anarchist fuds like Reinhold Kakothes, or big, fat, bespectacled, quiet boo-boos like Warren Coffin, and all the other hopeful poets were standing around in various costumes, worn at the sleeves, corduroy jackets, gruffly shoes, books sticking out of their pockets. But Jafey was in rough workman's clothes he had bought secondhand in Goodwill stores to serve him on mountain climbs and hikes, and for sitting in the open at night, for campfires, for hitchhiking up and down the coast. In fact, in his little knapsack, he also had a funny, a funny green alpine cap that he wore when he got to the foot of a mountain, usually with a yodel, before starting to tromp up a few thousand feet. He, was, he wore mountain climbing boots, expensive ones, his pride and joy, Italian made, in which he clumped around over the sawdust floor of the bar like an old-time lumberjack. Jafey wasn't big, just about five foot seven, but strong and wiry and fast and muscular. His face was a mask of woeful bone, but his eyes twinkled like the eyes of an old giggling sage of China over that little goatee to offset the rough look of his handsome face. His teeth were a little brown from early backwoods neglect, but you never noticed that, and he opened his mouth wide to guffaw at jokes. Sometimes he'd quiet down and just stare sadly at the floor like a man whittling. He was merry at times. He showed great sympathetic interest in me and in the story about the little St. Teresa bum and the stories I told him about my own experiences hopping freights or hitchhiking or hiking in woods. 
He claimed at once that I was a great bodhisattva, meaning great wise one, or great wise angel, and that I was ornamenting this world with my sincerity. We had some favorite Buddhist saints too. Avalokasvara, Aval, Avalokasvara, there we go. Or in Japanese, Kwanon, the eleven-headed. He knew all the details of Tibetan, Chinese, Mahayana, and Hinayana, Japanese, and even Burmese Buddhism. But a woman, I warned him at once, I didn't give a goddamn about the mythology and all the names and national flavors of Buddhism, but was just interested in the first, Sakya Muni's Four Noble Truths, that all life is suffering. And to an extent, interested in the third, the suppression of suffering can be achieved, which I didn't quite believe was possible then. I hadn't yet digested the Lenka Vatavar, the Lanka Vatara scripture, which eventually shows you that there's nothing in the world but the mind itself, and therefore all, po all is possible, including the suppression of suffering. Jafi's buddy was the aforementioned Boo Boo, big old good hearted Warren Coughlin, 180 pounds of poet meat, who was advertised by Jafi privately in my ear as being more than meets the eye. Coffee. Who is he? He's my big friend from up in Oregon. We've known each other a long time. At first you think he's slow and stupid, but actually he's a shining diamond. You'll see. Don't let him cut you to ribbons. He'll make the top of your head fly off, boy, with a choice chance of words. Why? He's a great mysterious bodhisattva. I think maybe a reincarnation of a sagna, the great Mahayana scholar of the old centuries. And who am I? I don't know. Maybe you're a goat. A goat? Maybe your mud face. Who's mud face? Mud face is the mud in your goat face. What would you say of someone who asked the question, does a dog have the Buddha nature, and said woo? Well, I'd say that was a lot of silly Zen super... I'd say that was a lot of silly Zen Buddhism. This took Jafee back a bit. Listen, Jafee, I said. I'm not a Zen Buddhist. I'm a serious Buddhist. I'm an old-fashioned, dreamy, Hinayana coward of late Mahayanism and so forth, into the night, my contention being that Zen Buddhism didn't concentrate on kindness so much as on confusing the intellect to make it perceive the illusion of all sources of things. It's mean, I complained. All those Zen masters throwing young kids in the mud because they can't answer their silly word questions? That's because they want, the, that's because they want them to realize mud is better than words, boy. But I can't recreate the exact... Uh, we'll try brilliance of all J.P.'s answers and comebacks and come-ons with which he had me on pins and needles all the time and did eventually stick something in my crystal head that made me change my life plan that made me change my plans in life. Anyway, I followed the whole gang of howling poets to the reading of at Gallery 6 that night, which was, among other important things, the night of the birth of the San Francisco Poetry Renaissance. Everyone was there. It was a mad night. And I was the one who got things jumping by going around collecting dimes and quarters from the rather stiff audience standing around in the gallery and coming back with three huge gallon jugs of California Burgundy and getting them all piffed so that by 11 o'clock when Alva Goldbook was reading his, wailing his poem, wail, drunk with arms outspread, everybody was yelling, go, 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 like a jam session. And old Reinhold Kakothes, the father of the Frisco poetry scene, was wiping his tears in gladness. Jafee himself read his fine poems about Coyote, the god of the North American Plateau Indians, I think, at least the god of the Northwest Indians, Kwakiutl, and, and what all. Fuck you, sang Coyote, and ran away, read Jafee to the distinguished audience, making them all howl with joy. It was so pure, fuck being a dirty word that comes out clean. And he had his tender lyrical lines, like the ones about bears eating berries, showing his love of animals, and great mystery lines about oxen on the Mongolian road, showing his knowledge of Oriental literature, even on to Suang Tsung, the great Chinese monk who walked from China to Tibet, Leng Chao to Kashgar and Mongolia, carrying a stick of incense in his hand. Then Jafi showed his sudden barroom humor with lines about coyote bringing goodies and his anarchistic ideas about how Americans don't know how to live with lines about commuters being trapped in living rooms that come from poor trees filled with chainsaws, showing here also his background as a logger up north. His voice was deep and resonant and somehow brave. Wait, I guess I need to change his voice then. I had him kind of sound like Bob Dylan. Totally not the right one. Okay, let's see. His voice was... Deep and resonant and somehow brave, like the voice 
of an old-time American hero is in orders. Maybe that's the one. In orders. Orators. Something earnest and strong and humanly hopeful I liked about him. While the other poets were either too dainty in their aestheticism or too hysterically cynical to hope for anything, or too abstract and endorsy or too political or like Coughlin, too incomprehensible to understand, Big Coughlin saying things about unclarified processes, though where Coughlin did say that revelation was a personal thing, I noticed the strong Buddhist and idealistic feeling of Jaffe, which he had shared with good-hearted Coughlin in their buddy days at college. And as I shared mine with Alva in the Eastern scene, with others less apocalyptical and straighter, but in no sense more sympathetic and tearful. Meanwhile, scores of people stood around in the darkened galleries, straining to hear every word of the amazing poetry reading as I was wandering from group to group, facing them and facing away from the stage and urging them to glug a slug from the jug or wandered back and sat on the right side of the stage, giving out little wows and yeses of approval and even whole sentences of comment with nobody's invitation. <laughs> but in the general gaiety, nobody's disapproval either. It was a great night, delicate Francis de Pavia read, from delicate onion skin yellow pages, or pink, which he kept flipping carefully with long white fingers, the poems of his dead chum Altman, who had eaten too much peyote in Chihuahua, or died of polio, one, but read none of his own poems, a charming elegy in itself to the memory of the dead young poet, enough to draw tears from the Cervantes of the chapter seven, and read them in a delicate English voice that had me crying with inside laughter, though I later got to know Francis and liked him. Among the people standing in the audience was Rosie Buchanan, a girl with a short haircut, red-haired, bony, handsome, a real gone chick and friend of everybody of any consequence on the beach, who had been a painter's model and a writer herself, and was bubbling over with excitement at that time because she was in love with my old buddy Cody. Great hey, Rosie, I yelled, and she took a big slug from my jug and shined eyes at me. Cody just stood behind her with both arms around her waist, between poets, Reinhold Kakothes in his bow tie and shabby old coat would get up and make a little funny speech in his snide, funny voice and introduce the next reader. But as I say, come 11.30 when all the poems were read and everybody was milling around and wondering what had happened and what would come next in American poetry, he was wiping his eyes with his handkerchief. We all got together with him and the poets and drove in several cars to Chinatown for a big fabulous dinner off the Chinese menu with chopsticks, yelling conversation in the middle of the night in one of those free-swinging great Chinese restaurants of San Francisco. This happened to be Jaffe's favorite Chinese restaurant, Nam Yun, and he showed me how to order and how to eat with chopsticks and told anecdotes about Zen lunatics of the Orient and had me going so glad, and we had a bottle of wine on the table that finally I went over to an old cook in the doorway of the kitchen and asked him, Why did Bodhidharma come from the West? Bodhidharma was the Indian who brought Buddhism eastward to China. I don't care, said the old cook with lidded eyes, and I told Jaffe, and he said, perfect answer, absolutely perfect. Now you know what I mean by Zen. I had a lot more to learn, too, especially about how to handle girls, Jaffe's incomparable Zoom lunatic way, which I got a chance to see firsthand the following week. In Berkeley, I was living with Alva Goldbook in his old rose-covered cottage in the backyard of a bigger house on Milvia Street. The old rotten porch slanted forward to the ground among vines in a nice old rocking chair that I sat in every morning to read my Diamond Sutra. The yard is full of tomato plants about to ripen, and mint, mint, everything smelling of mint, the one fine old tree that I love to sit under and meditate on those cool, perfect, starry California October nights, unmatched anywhere in the world. We had a perfect little kitchen with a gas stove, but no icebox, but no matter. We also had a perfect little bathroom with a tub and hot water and one main room covered with pillows and floor mats of straw and mattresses to sleep on and books, books, hundreds of books, everything from Catalyst to Pound to Blythe to albums of Bach and Beethoven and even one swinging Ella Fitzgerald album with Clark Terry, very interesting on trumpet, and a good three-speed webcore phonograph that played loud enough to blast the roof off and the roof nothing but plywood, the walls too, through which one night, in one of our Zen lunatic drunks, I put my fist in glee. And Coughlin saw me and put his head through about three inches. About a mile from there, way down Milvia, and then upslope toward the campus of the University of California, behind another big old house on a quiet street, Hillegas, Hillegas. Jaffe lived in his own shack, 
which was infinitely smaller than ours, about 12 by 12, with nothing in it but typical Jaffe appurtenances that showed his belief in the simple monastic life. No chairs at all, not even one sentimental rocking chair, but just straw mats. In the corner was his famous rucksack with cleaned up pots and pans, all fitting into one another in a compact unit and all tied and put away inside a knotted up blue bandana. But his Japanese wooden pot of shoes, which he never used, and a pair of black inside pot of socks to pat around softly in over his pretty straw mats. Just room for your four toes on one side, your big toe on the other. He had a slew of orange crates, all filled with beautiful scholarly books, some of them in Oriental languages. All the great sutras, comments on sutras, the complete works of D.T. Suzuki, and a fine quadruple volume edition of Japanese haikus. He also had an immense collection of valuable general poetry. In fact, if a thief should have broken in there, the only things of real value were the books. Jaffe's clothes were all hand-me-downs, bought second-hand with bemused and happy expression in Goodwill and Salvation Army stores. Wool socks, darned, colored undershirts, jeans, work shirts, moccasin shoes, and a few turtleneck sweaters that he wore, one on top of the other in the cold mountain nights of the high Sierras in California and the high Cascades of Washington and Oregon on the long, incredible jaunts that sometimes lasted weeks and weeks with just a few pounds of dried food in his pack. A few orange crates made his table, on which one late sunny afternoon as I arrived was steaming a peaceful cup of tea at his side as he bent his serious head to the Chinese signs of the poet Han Shang. Coughlin had given me the address, and I came there, seeing first Jaffe's bicycle on the lawn in front of the big house out front where his landlady lived, then a few odd boulders and rocks and funny little trees he had brought back from mountain jaunts to set out his own Japanese tin tea garden, or tea house garden, as there was a convenient pine tree sowing over his little domicile. A peacefuler scene I never saw than then. then then when, in that rather nippy late red afternoon, I simply opened his little door and looked in and saw him at the end of the little shack sitting cross-legged on a paisley pillow on a straw mat with his spectacles on, making him look old and scholarly and wise, with book on lap and the little tin teapot and porcelain cup steaming up at, side, at his side. He looked up very peacefully, saw who it was, said, Ray, come on in, and bent his eyes again to the script. What are you doing? Translating Han Shan's great poem called Cold Mountain. Written a thousand years ago, some of it scribbled on the sides of cliffs hundreds of miles away from any other living beings. Wow. When you come into this house, though, you've got to take your shoes off. See those straw mats? You can ruin them with shoes. So I took my soft-soled blue cloth shoes off and laid them dutifully by the door, and he threw me a pillow and I sat cross-legged along a little wooden board wall, and he offered me a cup of hot tea. Did you ever read the book of tea? he said. Said he. No, what's that? It's a scholarly treatise on how to make tea, utilizing all the knowledge of 2,000 years about brew tea brewing. Some of the descriptions of the effect of the first sip of tea and the second and the third are really wild and ecstatic. Those guys got high on nothing, eh? Sip your tea and you'll see. This is some good green tea. It was good, and I immediately felt calm and warm. Want me to read you parts of this Han Shan poem? Want me to tell you about Han Shan? Yeah. Han Shan, you see, was a Chinese scholar who got sick of the big city in the world and took off to hide in the mountains. Say, that sounds like you. In those days, you could really do it. He stayed in caves not far from a Buddhist monastery in the Changxing district of Qianche, and his only human friend was the funny Zen lunatic, Shi Te, who had a job sweeping out the monastery with a straw broom. Shi Te was a poet too, but he never wrote much down. Every now and then Han Shan would come down from Cold Mountain in his bark clothing and come into the warm kitchen and wait for food, but none of the monks would ever feed him because he didn't want to join the order and answer the meditation bell three times a day. You see why in some of his utterance, like, Listen, and I'll look here and read from the Chinese. And I bent over his shoulder and watched him read from big wild crow tracks of Chinese signs. Climbing up cold mountain path, cold mountain path goes on and on. Long gorge choked with scree and boulders. Wide creek and mist blurred grass. Moss is slippery through. Though there's been no rain, pine sings, but there's no wind. Who can leap the world's ties and sit with me among white clouds 
Well, of course, that's my own translation into English. You see, there are five signs from each line, and I have to put in Western prepositions and articles and such. Why don't you just translate it as it is? Five signs, five words. What's those first five signs? Sign for climbing, sign for up, sign for cold, sign for mountain, sign for path. Well, then translate it, climbing up cold mountain path. Yeah, but what do you do with the sign for long, sign for gorge, sign for choke, sign for avalanche, sign for boulders? Where's that? That's the third line. Would, and, would to, and would have to read, long, gorge, choke, avalanche, boulders. Well, that's even better. Well, yeah, I thought of that, but uh, I have to have this past approval of Chinese scholars here at the university and have it clear in English. Boy, what a great thing this is, I said looking around at the little shack. And you're sitting here so very quietly at this very quiet hour, studying all alone with your glasses. Ray, what, Ray, what you got to do is go climb a mountain with me soon. How would you like to climb Matterhorn? Great, where's that? It's up in the Sierras. We can go there with Henry Morley up his, in his car and bring our packs and take off from the lake. I could carry all the food and stuff we need in the rucksack and... You could borrow Alva's small knapsack and carry extra socks and shoes and stuff. What's these signs mean? These signs mean that Han Shan came down from his mountain after many years roaming around up there to see his folks in town and says, Till recently I stayed at Cold Mountain, etc. Yesterday I called on friends and family. More than half had gone to the Yellow Springs. That means death, the Yellow Springs. Now morning I face my lone shadow. I can't study with both eyes full of tears. Well, that's like you too, Jaffe, studying with eyes full of tears. My eyes aren't full of tears. Aren't they going to be after a long, long time? Well, they certainly will. They certainly will, Ray. And look here. In the mountain, it's cold. It's always been cold, not just this year. See, he's real high, maybe 12,000 or 13,000 feet or more, way up there and says... Jagged scarps always snowed in, woods in the dark ravine spitting mist. Grass is still sprouting at the end of June. Leaves begin to fall in early August. And here am I, high as a junkie. As a junkie? That's my, trans that's my translation. He actually says here, Am I as high as the sensualist in the city below? But I made it modern and high translation. Well, great. I wondered why Han Shan was Jaffe's hero. Because, said he, he was a poet, a mountain man, a Buddhist dedicated to the principle of meditation on the essence of all things. A vegetarian, too, by the way, though I haven't got, a, got on that kick from figuring maybe in the modern world to be a vegetarian is to split hairs little since all sentient beings eat what they can. He was a man of solitude, who would take off by himself and live purely and true to himself. Well, that sounds like you, too. And like you too, Ray. I haven't forgotten what you told me about how you made it in the woods meditating in North Carolina and all. Chafee was very sad, subdued after that. I'd never seen him so quiet, melancholy, thoughtful. His voice was as tender as a mother's. He seemed to be talking from far away to a poor yearning creature, me, who needed to hear his message. He wasn't putting anything on. He, he was in a bit of a trance, actually. Uh, so have you been just meditating all day? Yeah, I meditate first thing in the morning before breakfast, and I always meditate a long time in the afternoon, unless I'm interrupted. Who interrupts you? Oh, people. Coughlin sometimes. And Alva came yesterday, and Roll Sterlison, got his girl, comes over to play Yab Yum. Yab Yum, what's that? Don't you know about Yab Yum, Smith? I'll tell you later. He seemed to be too sad to talk about Yad Yum, which I found out about a couple of nights later. We, we talked a while longer about Han Shan and poems on cliffs, and as I was going away, his friend Rolf Sterlison, a tall, blonde, good-looking kid, came in to discuss his coming trip to Japan with him. This Ron Sterlison was interested in the fam famous Ryoanji rock garden of Sh Shokokuju Monastery in Kyoto, which is nothing but old boulders placed in such a way, supposedly mystically aesthetic as to cause thousands of tourists and monks every year to journey there to stare at the boulders in the sand, and thereby gain peace of mind. 
I've never met such weird yet serious and earnest people. I never saw Roll Sterlison again. He went to Japan soon after, but I can't forget what he said about the boulders to my question. Well, who placed them in that certain way that's so great? Nobody knows. Some monk or monks long ago, but there is a definite mysterious form in the arrangement of the rocks. It's only through form that we can realize emptiness. He showed me the picture of the boulders in well-raked sand looking like islands in the sea, looking as though they had eyes, declivities, and surrounded by a neatly screened and architectural monastery patio. Then he showed me a diagram of the stone arrangement with the, the projection and silhouette and showed me the geometrical logics and all, and mentioned the phrases, lonely individuality, and the rocks as bumps pushing into space, all meaning some kind of Cohen business. I wasn't as much interested in hit, in I was as, I wasn't as much interested in as in him, and especially in good kind Jaffe, who brewed more tea on his noisy gasoline primus and gave us added cups with almost a silent oriental bow. It was quite it was quite different from the night of the poetry readings. Oh wait, let me reread that last part. Then he showed me a diagram of the stone arrangement with a projection and silhouette and showed me the geometrical logics and all and mentioned the phrases lonely individuality and the rocks as bumps pushing into space, all meaning some kind of Cohen business that I was as much interested in as in him, and especially in good kind Chafee who brewed more tea on his noisy gasoline primus, etc. Chapter 4 But the next night about midnight, Coughlin and I and Alva got together and decided to buy a big gallon jug of burgundy and go bust in on Chafee in a shack. What's he doing tonight? I asked. Oh, says Jafe. Oh, says Coughlin. Probably studying, probably screwing. We'll go see. We bought the jug on Shattuck Avenue, way down, and went over and once more to saw his, once more I saw his pitiful English bicycle on the lawn. Jafe travels around on that bicycle with his little knapsack on his back all up and down Berkeley all day, said Coughlin. He used to do the same thing at Reed College in Oregon. He was a regular fixture up there. Then we'd throw big wine parties and have girls and end up jumping out windows and playing Joe College pranks all up and down town. Gee, he's strange, said Alva, biting his lip in a mood of marvel, and Alva himself was making a careful, interesting study of our strange, noisy, quiet friend. We came in the little door again. Jaffe looked up from his cross-legged study over a book, American Poetry this time, glasses on and said nothing but, ah, in a strangely cultured tone. We took off our shoes and padded across the little five feet of straw to sit by him, but I was last with my shoes off and had the jug in my hand, which I turned to show him from across the shack, and from his cross-legged position, Jafee suddenly roared, Yeah! and leaped up into the air and straight across the room to me, landing on his feet in a fencing position with a sudden dagger in his hand, the tip of it just barely stabbing the glass of the bottle with a small, distinct clink. It was the most amazing leap I ever saw in my life, except by nutty acrobats, much like a mountain goat, which he was, it turned out. Also reminded me of a Japanese samurai warrior, the yelling roar, the leap, the position, and his expression of comic wrath, his eyes bulging and making a big funny face at me. I had a feeling was really a complaint against our breaking in on his studies and against the wine itself, which would get him drunk and make him miss his planned evening of reading. But without further ado, he uncapped the bottle himself, took a big slug, and we all sat cross-legged and spent four hours screaming news at one another, one of the funniest nights. Some of it went like this. Chafee. Well, coffee, you old fart, what you been doing? Nothing. Alva. What are all these strange books here? Hmm, Pound. You like Pound? Except for the fact that the old fart face flubbed up the name of Lee Poi, Jaffe said, by calling him by his chi Japanese name and all such famous twaddle. <coughs> he was all right. In fact, he's my favorite poet. Ray, pound? He wants to make a favorite poet out of that pretentious nut. Jaffe, have some more wine, Smith. You're not making any sense. Who's your favorite poet, Alva? Ray, why don't, you, why don't somebody ask me my favorite poet? I know more about poetry than all you put together. Is that true? It might be. Haven't you seen Ray's new books of poems, said Alva? He just wrote in Mexico, The wheel of the quivering meat conception turns in the void, expelling ticks, porcupines, elephants, people, stardust, fools, nonsense. 
No, that's not it. Speaking of meat, said Jaffe, have you read the new poem of etc., etc., and then finally disintegrating into a wild talk fest and yell fest, finally song fest with people rolling on the floor and laughter and ending with Alva and Coughlin and I going staggering up the quiet college street arm in arm singing Eli Eli at the top of our voices and dropping the empty jug right at our feet in the crash of glass as Jaffe laughed from his little door. But we had made him miss his evening of study, and I felt bad about that, till the following night when he suddenly appeared at our little college with a pretty girl and came in and told her to take her clothes off, which he did at once. Chapter 5 This was in keeping with J.P.'s theories about women and love-making. I forgot to mention that the day the rock artist had called on him in the late afternoon, a girl had come right after, a blonde in rubber boots and a Tibetan coat with wooden buttons, and in the general talk she'd inquired about our plan to climb Mount Matterhorn, and said, Can I come with you? As she was a bit of a mountain climber herself. Sure, said Jaffe in his funny voice he used for joking, a, a big, loud, deep imitation of a lumberjack he knew in the north. Oh yeah, this is his joking voice. Sure, 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 said Jaffe in his funny voice he used for joking. A big, loud, deep imitation of a lumberjack he knew in the Northwest. A ranger, actually, old Bernie Byers. Sure, come on with us, and we'll all screw you at 10,000 feet. And the way he said it was so funny and casual, in fact, serious, that the girl wasn't shocked at all, but somewhat pleased. In the same spirit, he had now brought this girl princess to our, co to our cottage. In the same spirit, he had now brought this girl princess to our cottage. It was about 8 o'clock at night dark. Alva and I were quietly sipping tea and reading poems or typing poems at the typewriter and two bicycles came in the yard. Jaffe on his, Princess on hers. Princess had gray eyes and yellow hair and was very beautiful and only 20. I must say one thing about her, she was sex mad and man mad. So there wasn't much of a problem in persuading her to play Yab Yum. Don't you know about Yab Yum, Smith? Said Jaffe in his, wait, don't you know about, don't you know about Yab Yum Smith? Said Jaffe in his big booming voice, striding in his in in his boots, holding Princess's hand. Princess and I come here to show you, boy. Suits me, I said. Whatever it is. Also, I'd known Princess before and had been mad about her in the city about a year ago. It was just another wild coincidence that she had happened to meet Jaffe and fallen in love with him and madly too. She had do anything he said. Whenever people dropped in to visit us at the cottage, I'd always put my red bandana over the little wall lamp and put out that ceiling light to make a nice, cool, red, dim scene to sit and drink wine and talk in. I did this and went to get the bottle out of the kitchen and couldn't believe my eyes when I saw Jaffe and Alva taking their clothes off and throwing them every which way. And I looked, and Princess was stark naked, her skin white as snow when the red sun hits it at dusk in the dim red light. What the hell? I said. Here's what Yab Yum is, Smith," said Jaffe, and he sat cross-legged on the floor on the on the pillow. And he sat cross-legged on the pillow on the floor and motioned to Princess, who came over and sat down on him, facing him with her arms about his neck. And they sat like that, saying nothing for a while. Jaffe wasn't at all nervous and embarrassed; just sat there in perfect form, just as he was supposed to do. This is what they do in the temples of Tibet. It's a holy ceremony. It's done just like this in front of chanting priests. People pray and recite Om Mani Padme Hum, which means, Amen the thunderbolt in the dark void. See, I'm the thunderbolt and Princess is the dark void, you see? But what's she thinking, I yelled, almost in despair. What's she thinking? I'd had such idealistic longings for that girl in that past year and had conscience-stricken hours wondering if I should seduce her because she was so young and all. Oh, this is lovely, said Princess. Come on and try it. But I can't sit cross-legged like that. Jaffe was sitting in the full lotus position, it's called, both ankles over both thighs. Alva was sitting on the mattress trying to yank his ankles over his thighs to do it. Finally, Jaffe's legs began to hurt, and they just tumbled over the mattress. Over on the mattress were both Alva and Jaffe began to explore the territory. I still couldn't believe it. Take your clothes off. Join us, Smith. But on top of all that, the feelings about Princess. I'd also gone through an entire year of celibacy based on my feeling that 
lust was the direct cause of birth, which was the direct cause of suffering and death. And I really know lie come to a point where I regarded lust as offensive and cruel. Pretty girls make graves, was my saying. Whenever I'd, whenever I'd had to turn my head around involuntarily to stare at the incomparable pretties in India and Mexico, and the absence of act, act of lust in me had also given me a new peaceful life that I was enjoying a great deal. But this was too much. I was still afraid to take my clothes off. Also, I never liked to do that in front of more than one person, especially with men around. But Jaffe didn't give a goddamn hoot and holler about any of this. Pretty soon he was making Princess happy, and then Alva had a turn. With his big serious eyes staring in the dim light, and him reading poems a minute er (laughs) just a minute earlier. So I said, "Uh, how about me just uh, starting to work on an arm? Go ahead, great! Which I did, lying down on the floor with all my clothes on and kissing her hand, then her wrist, then up to her body as she laughed and almost cried with delight. Everybody everywhere just a-working on her. All the peaceful celibacy of my Buddhism was going down the drain. Smith, I distrust any kind of Buddhism or any kind of philosophy or social system that puts down sex, said Jaffe, quite scholarly now that he was done and sitting naked, cross-legged, rolling himself a bull Durham cigarette, which he did as part of his simplicity life. I ended up with everybody naked. It ended up with everybody naked and finally making gay pots of coffee in the kitchen and princess on the kitchen floor, naked, her knees clasped in her arms, lying on her side just for uh, nothing, just to do it. Then finally she and I took a warm bath together in the bathtub and could hear Alva and Jaffe discussing zen-free love lunacy orgies in the next room. Hey, Princess, we'll do this every Thursday night, okay? Yelled Jaffe. It'll be a regular function. Yeah, called, yelled Princess from the bathtub. I'm telling you, she was actually glad to do all this. and Told me, you know, I feel like I'm the mother of all things, and I have to take care of my little children. But you're such a young, pretty thing yourself. But I'm also the mother of earth and a bodhisattva. She was just a little off her nut, but when I heard her say bodhisattva, I realized that she wanted to be a big Buddhist like Jaffe, and being a girl, the only way she could express it was this way, which had its traditional roots in the Yab Yum ceremony of Tibetan Buddhism. So everything was fine. Alva was immensely pleased, and it was all for the ideal of every Thursday night, and so was I by now. Alva, princess says she's a bodhisattva. Of course she is. She says she's the mother of all of us. The bodhisattva women of Tibet and parts of ancient India, said Jaffe, were taken and used as holy concubines in temples, sometimes in ritual caves, and would get to lay up a stock of merit, and they meditated too. All the men, women, they'd meditate fast, have balls like this, go back to eating, drinking, talking, hike around, live in viharas in the rainy season and outdoors in the dry. There was no question of what to do about sex, which is always what I always liked about Oriental religion, and what I always dug about the Indians in our country. You know, when I was a little kid in Oregon, I didn't feel like that I was an American at all, with all that suburban ideal and sex repression and general dreary newspaper gray censorship of all our real human values. But when I discovered Buddhism and all, I suddenly felt that I had lived in a previous lifetime, innumerable ages ago. And now because of faults and sins in that lifetime, I was being degraded to a more grievous domain of existence. And my karma was to be born in America, where nobody has any fun or believes in anything. Especially freedom. But that's why... It, That's why I was always sympathetic to freedom movements, like anarchism in the Northwest, the old-time heroes of Everett Massacre and all. It ended ended up with long, earnest discussions about all these subjects, and finally Princess got dressed and went home with Jaffe on their bicycles, and Alva and I sat facing each other in the dim red light. But you know, Ray, Jaffe is really sharp. He's really the wildest, craziest, sharpest cat we've ever met. And what I love about him is he's the big hero of the West Coast. Do you realize I've been out here for two years now and hadn't met anybody worth knowing really or anybody with any truly illuminated intelligence and was giving up hope for the West Coast? Besides all the background he has in Oriental scholarship, pound, taking peyote, seeing visions, his mountain climbing, 
be cooing. Well, J.P. Ryder is a great new hero of American culture. Well, he's mad, I agreed. And other things I liked about him, his quiet, sad moments when he don't say much. Gee, I wonder what'll happen to him in the end. Well, I think he'll end up like Han Sean, living alone in the mountain, writing poems on the walls of cliffs, maybe chanting them to crowds outside of his cave. Or maybe he'll go to Hollywood and be a movie star. You know, he said that the other day. He said, all the, you know, I've never thought of going to the movies and becoming a star. I can do anything, you know. I haven't tried that yet. And I believe him. I believe he can do anything. Did you see the way he had Princess all wrapped around him? A, indeed. And, late, and later that night, as Alva slept, I sat under the tree in the yard and looked up at the stars or closed my eyes to meditate and tried to quiet myself down back to normal self. Alva couldn't sleep and came out and lay flat on his back in the grass looking up the sky and said, Big steamy clouds going by in the dark up there. It makes me realize we live on an actual planet. Close your eyes and you'll see more than that. Oh, I don't know what you mean by all that, he said pettishly. He was always being bugged by my little lectures on samadhi ecstasy, which is the state you actually reach when you stop everything and stop your mind and you actually, with your eyes closed, see a kind of eternal multi-swarm of electrical power or of some kind, ululating in place of just pitiful images and forms of objects, which are, after all, imaginary. If you don't believe me, come back in a million years and deny it. For what is time? Don't you think it's much more interesting just to be like Jaffe and have girls and studies and good times and really be doing something than all this silly sitting under trees? Nope, I said, and meant it. And I knew Jaffe would agree with me. All Jaffe's doing is amusing himself in the void. I don't think so. I bet he is. I'm going mountain climbing with him next week, and I'll, I'll find out and tell you. Well, as for me, I'm just going to go on being Alva Gold Book, and to hell with all this Buddhist bullshit. You'll be sorry someday. Why don't you ever understand what I'm trying to tell you? It's with your six senses that you're fooled into believing not only that you have six senses, but that you contact an outside world with them. If it wasn't for your eyes, you wouldn't see me. If it wasn't for your ears, you wouldn't hear that airplane. If it wasn't for your nose, you wouldn't smell the midnight mint. If it wasn't for your tongue taster, you wouldn't taste the difference between A and B. If it wasn't for your body, you wouldn't feel princess. There's no me, no airplane, no mind, no princess, no nothing. You, for Christ's sake, do you want to go on being fooled every damn minute of your life? Yeah, that's all I want. I thank God that something has come out of nothing. Well, I've got news for you. It's the other way around. Nothing has come out of something, and that something is Dharmakaya, the body of the true meaning. And that nothing is this, and all this twaddle and talk. I'm going to bed. Well, sometimes I see a flash of illumination in what you're trying to say, but believe me, I got more out of a Satori, I got more of a Satori out of Princess than out of words. Well, it's a Satori of your foolish flesh, you lecher. I know that my Redeemer liveth. What Redeemer? And what liveth? Oh, let's just cut this out and live! Balls. When I thought like you, Alva, I was just as miserable and graspy as you are now. All you want to do is run out there and get laid and get beat up and get screwed up and get old and sick and banged around by Samsara. Fucking eternal meat of comeback. You, you'll deserve it too, and I'll say that's not nice, said Alva. Everybody's cheerful and trying to live with what they got. Your Buddhism has made you mean, Ray. It makes you even afraid to take your clothes off for a simple, healthy orgy. Well, I did finally, didn't I? But you were coming on so hinky about it. Oh, let's forget it. Alva went to bed and I sat and closed my eyes and thought, This thinking has stopped. But because I had to think it, no thinking had stopped. But there did come over me a wave of gladness to know that all this perturbation was just a dream already ended. And I didn't have to worry because I wasn't I. And I prayed that God or Tathagata would give me enough time and enough sense and strength to be able to tell people what I knew, as I can't even do properly now, so they know what I know and not despair so much. The old tree brooded over me silently, a living thing. I heard a mouse snoring in the garden weeds.
The rooftops of Berkeley looked like pitiful living meats sheltering grieving phantoms from the eternality of the heavens which they feared to face. By the time I went to bed, I wasn't taken in by no princess, or no desire for no princess, and nobody's disapproval, and I felt glad and slept well. Chapter 6 Now came the time for a big mountain climb. Jaffe came over in late afternoon on his bike to get me. We took out Alva's knapsack and put it in his bike basket. I took out socks and sweaters, but I had no climbing shoes, and the only things I could serve were Jaffe's tennis sneakers, old but firm. My own shoes are too floppy and torn. That might be better, Ray. With sneakers, your feet are light, and you can jump from boulder to boulder with no trouble. Of course, we'll swap shoes at certain times and make it. <clears throat> what about food? What are you bringing? Well, before I tell you about food, Ray, sometimes he called me by my first name and always did. When he did, it was long, drawn out, and sad, like Ray, as though he was worried about my welfare. I've got your sleeping bag. It's not a duck down like my own, and naturally a lot heavier, but with clothes on like a big fire, you'll be comfortable up there. Clothes on, yeah, but why a big fire? It's only October. Yeah, but it's below freezing up there, Ray, in October he said sadly. At night? Yeah, at night, and in the daytime it's real warm and pleasant. You know, old John used to go up there in those mountains where we're going with nothing but his old army coat and a paper bag full of dried bread, slept in his coat and just soaked the old bread and water when he wanted to eat, and he roamed around like that for months before tramping back to, tramping back to the city. My goodness, he must have been tough. Now as for food, I went down to Market Street to the Crystal Palace Market and Brought my favorite dry cereal, bulgur, which is kind of a Bulgarian cracked rough wheat, and I'm going to stick pieces of bacon in it like square chunks. That'll make fine supper for all three of us, Marley and us, and I'm bringing tea. You always want a good cup of hot tea under those cold stars. And I'm bringing real chocolate pudding, not that instant phony stuff, but good chocolate pudding that I'll bring to a boil and stir over the fire and let it cool ice cold in the snow. Oh boy! So instead of rice this time, which I usually bring, I thought I'd make a nice delicacy for you, Ray. And in the bulgur, too, I'm going to throw in all kinds of dry diced vegetables I bought at Ski Shop. We'll have, our supper and, we'll have our supper and breakfast out of this, and for energy food, this big bag of peanuts and raisins, and another bag with dried apricots and dried prunes ought to fix us for the rest. And he showed me the very tiny bag in which all this important food for three grown men for 24 hours or more climbing it, High altitudes was stored. The main thing in going to, going to mountains is to keep the weight as far down as possible. Those packs get heavy. But my God, there's not enough food in that little bag. The other is, the water swells it up. Do we bring wine? No, it isn't any good up there. Once you're at high altitude and tired, you don't crave alcohol. I didn't believe this, but said nothing. We put my own things on the bike and walked across the campus to his place, pushing the bike along the edge of the sidewalk. It was a cold, clear Arabian dusk with a tower clock of University of Cal, a clean black shadow against a backdrop of cypress and eucalyptus and all kinds of trees, bells ringing somewhere, the air crisp. It's going to be cold up there, said Jaffe. But he was feeling fine that night and laughed when I asked him about next Thursday with Princess. You know, we played Yab, Yab Yum twice more since that last night. She comes over to my shack any, night, any day or night. Any minute... <coughs> Let me start that over again. You know, we played Yab Yum twice more since that last night. She comes over to my shack any day or night, any minute. And man, she won't take no for an answer. So I sat aside the Bodhisattva, and Jaffe wanted to talk about everything, his boyhood in Oregon. You know, my mother and father and sister were living in a real primitive life on that log cabin farm, and, no, and on cold winter mornings we'd all undress and dress in front of the fire. We had to. That's why I'm not like you about undressing. I mean, I'm not bashful or anything like that. What you used to do around college? Well, in the summers I was always a Government fire lookout. That's what you ought to do next summer, Smith. And in the winters, I did a lot of skiing and used to walk around the campus on crutches, real proud. I climbed some pretty big mountains up there, including a long haul up Rainier 
almost to the top where you sign your name. I finally made it one year. There was only a few names up there, you know. And I climbed all around the Cascades, off-season, in-season, worked as a logger. Smith, I've got to tell you all about the romance of Northwest logging. Like you keep talking about railroading, you should have seen the little narrow gorge railways up there and those cold winter mornings with snow and your belly full of pancakes and syrup and black coffee. Boy, you raise your double buttered axe to your morning's first log and there's nothing like it. That's just like my dream of the great Northwest, I said. The Quake Udall Indians and the Northwest Mounted Police. Well, they're, they're in Canada. They got them over in British Columbia. I used to meet some on the trail. We pushed the bike down past the various college hangouts and cafeterias and looked into Robbie's to see if we knew anybody. Alva was in there working his part-time job as busboy. Jafe and I were kind of outlawish, outlandish looking on the campus in our old clothes. In fact, Chafee was considered an eccentric around the campus, which is the usual thing for campuses and college people to think whenever a real man appears on the scene. Colleges being nothing but grooming schools for the middle-class non-identity, which usually finds its perfect expression on the outskirts of the campus and rows of well-to-do houses with lawns and television sets in each living room, everybody looking at the same thing and thinking the same thing at the same time, while the Jafees of the world go prowling in the wilderness to hear the voice crying in the wilderness to find the ecstasy of the stars, to find the dark, mysterious secret of the origin of, origin of faceless, wonderless, crapulous civilization. All these people, said Jafee, they all got white tiled toilets and take big dirty craps like bears in the mountains, but it's all washed away to convenient supervised sewers and nobody thinks of crap anymore or realizes that their origin is shit and civet and scum of the sea. They spend all day washing their hands with creamy soaps they secretly want to eat in the bathroom. He had a million ideas. He had them all. We got to his little shack as it grew dark, and you could smell wood smoke and smoke of leaves in the air, and packed everything up neat and went down the street to meet Henry Morley, who had the car. Henry Morley was a bespectacled fellow of great learning, but an eccentric himself, more eccentric and outre than Jafee on the campus, a librarian with few friends, but a mountain climber. His own little one-room cottage in the back lawn of Berkeley was filled with books and pictures of mountain climbing and scattered all over with rucksacks, climbing boots, skis. I was amazed to hear him talk. He talked exactly like Reinhold Kokothes, the critic. It turned out they had been friends long ago and climbed mountains together, and I couldn't tell whether Morley had influenced Kokothes or the other way around. I felt it was Morley who had done the influencing. He had the same snide, sarcastic, extremely witty, well-formulated speech with thousands of images, like when Chafee and I walked in and there was a gathering of Morley's friends in, the, in there, a strange outlandish group, including one Chinese and one German from Germany and several other students of some kind, and Morley said, I'm bringing my air mattress. You guys can sleep on that old cold ground if you want, but I'm going to have pneumatic aid. Besides, I went and spent $16 on it in the wilderness of Oakland Army Navy stores and drove all day wondering if with roller skates or suction cups you can technically call yourself a vehicle or some such thing incomprehensible to everyone else. Secret meaning joke of his own, to which nobody listened much anyway. He kept talking and talking as though to himself, but I liked him right away. We sighed when we saw the huge amounts of junk he wanted to take on the climb. Even canned goods, and besides his rubber air mattress, a whole lot of pickaxe and whatnot equipment we had really never used. <laughs> you can carry that axe, Morley, but I don't think we'll need it. Canned goods is just a lot of water you have to lug on your back. Don't you realize we got all the water we wanted waiting for us up there? Well, I just thought a can of this Chinese chop suey would be kind of tasty. I've got enough food for all of us. Let's go. Morley spent a long time talking and fishing around and getting together his unwieldy packboard, and finally we said goodbye to his friends and got into Morley's little English car and started off about 10 o'clock towards Tracy and up to Bridgeport from where we could drive another eight miles to the foot of the trail at the lake. I sat in the back seat and they talked up front. Morley was an actual madman. He would come and he would come and get me later, carrying a quart of eggnog, expecting me to drink that, but I'd make him drive me to a liquor score, store, and the whole idea was to go out and see some girl, and he'd have me come along to act as a pacifier of some sort, and we came to her door, and she opened it, and when she saw, saw who it was, she had slammed the door, and we'd drive back to the cottage. Well, what was this? What's well, a long story. 
Morley would say vaguely. I never quite understood what he was up to. Also, seeing Alva had no spring bed in the cottage, one day he appeared like a ghost in a doorway as we were innocently getting up and brewing coffee and presented us with a huge double bed spring that after he left, we struggled to hide in the barn. And he'd bring out assorted boards and whatnot, and possible bookshelves, all kinds of things. And years later, I had further three Stooges adventures. Had, and this, and years later, I had further three Stooges adventures with him going out to his house in Contra Costa, which he owned and rented, and spending impossible to believe afternoons when he paid me two dollars an hour for hauling out bucket after bucket of mud slime, which he himself was doling out a flooded cellar by hand, black and mud covered as Tartara Luke, the king of the mud slimes of. Pratiquilacaca span with a secret grin of elfish delight on his face and later returning through some little town and wanting ice cream cones we'd walk down Main Street and hiked on the highway with buckets and rakes ice cream cones in our hands knocking into people on the little sidewalks like a couple of old-timey Hollywood silent film comedians whitewash and all an extremely strange person anyway in any case any old way you looked at it Drove the car now out towards Tracy on the busy four-laner highway and did most of the talking. At everything Jafey said, he had twelve to say, and it went like this. Jafey would say something like, By God, I feel real studious lately. I think I'll read some ornithology next week. Morley would say, Who doesn't feel studious when he doesn't have a girl with a Riviera suntan? Every time he had something, he would turn and look at Jafey and deliver these rather brilliant inanities of the complete deadpan. I couldn't understand what kind of strange, secret, scholarly, linguistic clown he really was under these California skies. Or Jafey would mention sleepy bags and Morley would ramble in with, I'm going to be the possessor of a pale blue French sleeping bag. Lightweight, goose down, goodbye, I think. Find him in Vancouver. Good for Daisy May. Completely wrong type for Canada. Everyone wants to know if her grandmother was an explorer who met an Eskimo. I'm from the North Pole myself. What's he talking about? I'd ask from the back seat. And Jafey, he's just an interesting tape recorder. I told the boys I had a touch of thrombophilitis, blood clots in the veins in my feet, and was afraid about tomorrow's climb, not that it would hobble me, but it would get worse when we came down. Morley said, is this thrombophilobitis a peculiar rhythm for piss? Or I'd say something about Westerners, and he'd say, I'm a dumb Westerner. Look what preconceptions have done to England. You're crazy, Morley. I don't know, maybe I am. But if I'm, I am, I'll leave a lovely will anyways. Then out of nowhere he would say, Well, I'm very pleased to go climbing with two poets. I'm going to write a book myself. It'll be about Ragusa, a late medieval maritime city-state republic which solved the class problem, offered the secretaryship to Machiavelli, and for a generation had its language used as a diplomatic one for the Levant. This was because of pool with the Turks, of course. Of course, we'd say. So he'd ask himself the question out loud. Can you secure Christmas with an approximation only 18 million seconds left of the original old red chimney? Sure, says Jafey laughing. Sure, says Morley, wheeling the car around increasing curves. They're boarding reindeer greyhound specials for a preseason heart-to-heart happiness conference deep in Sierra Wilderness, 10,560 yards from a primitive motel. It's newer than analysis and deceptively simple. If you lost the round-trip ticket, you can become a gnome. The outfits are cute, and there's a rumor that Actors' Equity convenient Convention sop up the overflow bounce from the Legion. Either way, of course, Smith, turning to me in the back, and in finding your way back to the emotional wilderness, you're bound to get a present from someone. Will some maple syrup help you feel better? Sure, Henry. And that was Morley. Meanwhile, the car began climbing into the foothills somewhere, and we came to su- sundry sullen towns where we stopped for gas and nothing but blue jean Elvis Presley's in the road, waiting to beat somebody up. But down beyond them, the roar of fresh creeks and the feel of the high mountains not far away, the pure sweet night. Finally, we got out on a real narrow tar country road and headed up toward the mountains for sure. Tall pine trees begin to appear out of the side of the road, an occasional rock cliff. The air felt nippy and grand. This also happened to be the opening eve of the hunting season, and in a bar where we stopped for a drink, there were many hunters in red caps and wool shirts looking silly, getting loaded with all their guns and shells in their cars, and eagerly asking us if we'd seen any deer or not. 
We had certainly seen deer just before we came to the bar. Morley had been driving and talking and saying, Well, Ryder, maybe you'll be Alfred Lord Tennyson of our little tennis party here on the coast. They'll call you the new Bohemian and compare you to the Knights of the Round Table, minus Amadis the Great and the extraordinary splendors of the little Moorish kingdom that was sold round to Ethiopia for 17,000 camels and 600 foot soldiers when Caesar was sucking on his mammy's teeth. And suddenly the deer was in the road, looking out our headlamps, petrified, before leaping into the shrubbery by the side of the road and disappearing into the sudden vast diamond silence of the forest, which we heard as Morley cut the do which we heard as Morley cut the motor, and just the scuffle of his hooves running off to the haven of the raw fish Indian up there in the mists. It was real country we were in. Morley said about thousand feet, but Morley said about three thousand feet now. We could hear creeks rushing coldly below on cold starlit rocks without seeing them. Hey, little deer, I yelled to the animal. Don't worry, we won't shoot you. Now in the bar where we'd stopped at my insistence in this kind of cold northern up mountain country, ain't nothing better for a man's soul at midnight but a good warm glass of warm and red port, heavy as a syrups of King Arthur. Okay, Smith says Jaffe, but seems to me we shouldn't drink on a hiking trip. Ah, oh, who gives a damn? Okay, but look at all the money we saved by buying cheap dried foods from, for this weekend, and you're gonna, all you're going to do is drink it right down. That's the story of my life. Rich or poor, and mostly poor, and truly poor. We went in the bar, which was a roadhouse all done up in the upcountry mountain style, like a Swiss chalet, Moose heads and designs of deer on the booze and people in the bar itself, an advertisement for the hunting season, but all of them loaded and weaving massive shadows at the dim bars as we walked in and sat at three stools and ordered the port. The port was a strange request in the whiskey country of hunters, but the bartenders rousted up an odd bottle of Christian Brothers Port and poured us two shots and wide wine glasses, morally a teetotaler actually, and Jaffe and I drank and felt fine. Ah, said Jaffe, warming up to his wine in midnight. Soon I'm going back north to visit my childhood, wet woods and cloudy mountains and old bitter intellectual friends and old drunken logger friends, by God. Ray, you ain't lived till you've been up there with me or without. And then I'm going to Japan. I walk all over that hilly country, finding ancient little temples hidden and forgotten in the mountains and old sages a hundred and nine years old praying to Quanon and huts and meditating so much that when they come out of meditation, they laugh at everything that moves. But that don't mean I don't love America, by God, though I hate these damn hunters. All they want to do is level a gun at a helpless sentient beings and murder it. For every sentient being or living creature these actual pricks kill, they will be reborn a thousand times to suffer the horrors of samsara. Damn good for them, too. Hear that, Morley? Henry? What do you think? My Buddhism, and it's, my Buddhism is nothing but a mild, unhappy interest in some of the pictures they've drawn, though I must say something Kakothi strikes a nutty note of Buddhism in this mountain climbing poem, though I'm not sh much interested in the belief part of it. In fact, it didn't make a goddamn much of a difference to him. I'm neutral, said he, laughing happily with a kind of eager, slaking leer, and Jaffe yelled, Neutral is what Buddhism is. Well, that port will make you have to swear off yogurt. You know, I am a a fratiori, disappointed because there's no Benedictine or Trappist wine, only Christian brothers, holy waters, and spirits around here. Not that I feel very expensive about, expensive about being here in that curious bar anyway. It looks like the home plate for Ciardi and bread loaf winners. Bread loaf writers. Armenian grocers, all of them. Well-meaning awkward Protestants who are on a group excursion for a binge and want to and want to but don't know how to insert the contraption the contraception. <laughs> it looks like the home plate for Chiardi and bread loaf writers, Armenian grocers, all of them. Well-meaning awkward Protestants who are on a group excursion for a binge and want to but don't understand how to insert the con contraception. These people must be assholes, he added in sudden straight revelation. The milk around here must be fine, but more cows than people. This must be a different race of Anglos up here. 
I don't particularly warm up to their appearance. The fast kids around here must go 34 miles. Well, JV, said he, including, concluding, if you ever get an official job, I hope you get a Brooks Brothers suit. Hope you don't wind up in artsy-fartsy parties where it would say, as some girls walked in, young hunters must be why the baby wards are open all year. But the hunters didn't like us to be huddled there talking close and friendly in low voices about sundry personal topics and joined us and pretty soon it was a long funny harangue up and down the oval bar about deer in the locality, where to go climb, what to do, and when they heard we were out in this country not to kill animals but just to climb mountains, they took us to be hopeless eccentrics and left us alone. Jafe and I had two wines and felt fine and went back in the car with Morty and we drove away higher and higher. The trees taller, the air colder, climbing till finally it was almost two o'clock in the morning. And they said we had a long way to go yet to Bridgeport and the foot of the trail, so we might as well sleep out in these woods in our sleeping bags and call it a day. We'll get up at dawn and take off. Meanwhile, we have this good brown bread and cheese too, said Jafey, producing it. Brown bread and cheese he had thrown in at the last minute in his little shack. And that'll make a fine breakfast, I say. We'll save the bulgur and goodies for our breakfast tomorrow morning at 10,000 at at 10, feet. Fine. Still talking at all. Morley drove the car a little way over some hard pine needles under an immense spread of natural park trees, firs, ponderosas, a hundred feet high, some of them. A great quiet starlit grove with frost on the ground and dead silence except for occasional little ticks of sound in the thickets where maybe a rabbit stood petrified hearing us. I got up my sleeping bag and spread it out and took off my shoes, and just as I was sighing happily and slipping my stocking feet into my sleeping bag and looking around gladly at the beautiful tall trees, thinking, Ah, oh, what a night of true sweet sleep this will be. What meditations I can get into in this intense silence of nowhere. Jafe yelled at me from the car, Say, it appears Mr. Morley has forgotten his sleeping bag. What? Oh, now what? They discussed it a while, fiddling with flashlights in the frost, and then Jafey came over and said, You have to crawl out of there, Smith. All we have is two sleeping bags now and got to zip them up. Spur them out to form a blanket for three. God damn it, that'll be cold. What? And the coat will sleep in all around the bottoms. Well, Henry can't sleep in that car. He'll freeze to death. No heater. But God damn it! I was all ready to enjoy this so much. I whined, getting out and putting on my shoes, and pretty soon Jafey had fixed the two sleeping bags on top of ponchos and was already settled down to sleep, and on, on toss it was me had to sleep in the middle, and it was way below freezing by now, and the stars were icicles of mockery. I got in and lay down, and Morley and I, I could hear the maniac blowing up his ridiculous air mattress so he could lay beside me. But the moment he had done so, he, start, he started at once to turn over and heave and sigh. And around the other side, the back towards me, and around the other side, all under the ice cold stars and loveliness, while Jafey snored. Jafey, he wasn't subjected to all the mad wiggling. Finally, Morley couldn't sleep at all and got up and went to the car, probably to talk to himself in that mad way of his. And I got a wink of sleep. But in a few minutes he was back, freezing, and got under the sleeping bag blanket that started to turn and turn again, even cursed once in a while, or sigh, and this way on for that, and for what seemed to be eternities. And the first thing I knew, Aurora was paling the eastern hymns of Amida, and pretty soon we'd be getting up anyway. That mad Morley, and this was only the beginning of the misadventures of that most remarkable man. As you'll see now, that remarkable man, he was probably the only mountain climber in the history of the world who forgot to bring a sleeping bag. Jesus, I thought. Why didn't he just forget his jury air mattress instead? Chapter 7. Chapter 7. From the very first moment we had met Morley, he had kept emitting sudden yodels in keeping with our venture. This was a simple yodel lady, yodel lady who. But it came at the oddest moments, and in oddest circumstances, like several times when his Chinese and German friends were still around, and later in the car, sitting with us and closed, yodel lady. And then as we got out of the car to go to the bar, yodel lady. -hoo. 
Now as Jafy woke up and saw it was dawn and jumped out of the bags and ran to gather firewood and shut her over a little preliminary fire, Morty woke up from his nervous small sleep of dawn, yawned, and yelled, Yodel lady! which echoed towards veils in the distance. Hmm. I got up too. It was all we could do to hold together. The only thing to do was hop around and flap your arms, like me and my sad bum on the gone on the south coast. But soon Jafey got more logs on the fire, and it was a roaring bonfire that we turned our backs to every, after a while and yelled and talked. A beautiful morning! Red, pristine shafts of sunlight coming in over the hill and slanting down into the cold trees like cathedral light and mist rising to meet the sun. All the way around the giant secret roar of tumbling creeks, probably with films of ice in the pools. Great fishing country. Pretty, pretty soon I was yelling, Yoda lady, hee! Myself, but when Jafey went to fetch more wood and we couldn't see him for a while and Morley yelled, Yoda lady, hee! Jafey answered back with a simple, whoo, which he said was the Indian way to call on the mountain and much nicer, so I began to yell, whoo, myself. Then we got in the car and started off. We ate the bread and cheese. No difference between the Morley of this morning and the Morley of last night, except his voice as he rattled on, yak as he rattled on yakking in that cultured, snide, funny way of his was sort of cute with that morning freshness, like the way people's voice sound after getting up early in the morning. Something faintly wistful and hoarse and eager in it, ready for a new day. Soon the sun was warm. The black bread was good, and it had been baked by Sean Monahan's wife, Sean who had a shack in Corte Madera, who we could all go live in free of rent some day. The cheese was sharp cheddar, but it didn't satisfy me much, and we got out into country with no more houses, anything, and I began to yearn for a good old hot breakfast. And suddenly, after we'd gone over a little creek bridge, we saw... A merry little lodge by the side of the road under tremendous juniper trees with smoke boiling out of the chimney and neon signs outside and a, a sign in the window advertising pancakes and hot coffee. Let's go in there, by God. We need a man's breakfast if we're going to climb all day. Nobody complained about my idea. and We went in and sat at booths and a nice woman took her orders with that cheery loquaciousness of people in the back country. Well, you boys going hunting this morning? No, said Jeffy. Just climbing Matterhorn. Matterhorn? Why well, I wouldn't do that if somebody paid me a thousand dollars. Meanwhile, I went out to the log johns out back and washed from water in the tap, which was delightfully cold and made my face tingle. And then I drank some of it and was like cool liquid ice in my stomach and sat there real nice. And I had more. Shaggy dogs are barking in the golden red sunlight slanting down from the hundred feet foot branches of the firs and ponderosas. I could see snow-capped mountains glittering in the distance. One of them was Matterhorn. I went in, and the pancakes were ready, hot and steaming, and poured syrup over my three pats of butter, and cut them down, and slurped hot coffee, and ate. So did Henry and Jafey for once, and no conversation. Then we washed it all down with the incomparable cold water as hunters came in, hunting boots, wool shirts, no giddy drunk hunters, but serious hunters, ready to go out there after breakfast. There was a bar adjoining, but nobody cared about alcohol this morning. We got in the car, crossed another creek bridge, and crossed a meadow with a few cows and log cabins, and came out on a plain which clearly showed Matterhorn rising the highest, most awful looking at the jagged peaks to the south. There she is, said Morley really <coughs> There she is, said Morley really proud. Isn't it beautiful? Doesn't it remind you of the Alps? I've got a collection of snow-covered mountain photos you should see sometime. I like the real thing myself, said Jafey, looking seriously at the mountain. In that far-off look in his eyes, that secret self-sigh, I saw he was back home again. Bridgeport is a little sleepy town, curiously New England-like on that plain. Two restaurants, two gas stations, a school, all sidewalk, highway, 395 as it comes through, running from down Bishop way up to Carson City, Nevada. Chapter 8. Chapter 8. Now another incredible delay was caused as Mr. Morley decided to see if he could find a store open in Bridgeport and buy a sleeping bag or at least a canvas cover or tarpaulin of some kind for tonight's sleep at 9,000 feet. And judging from last night's sleep at 4,000, it was bound to be pretty cold. Meanwhile, Jafey and I waited, sitting in the now hot sun of 10 a.m. on the grass of the school, 
watching occasional laconic traffic pass by on the not busy highway and watching to see the fortunes of a young Indian hitchhiker pointed north. We discussed him warmly. That's what I like, hitchhiking around, feeling free. Imagine, though, being an Indian and doing all that. Damn it, Smith. Let's go talk to him and wish him luck. The Indian wasn't very talkative, but not unfriendly. Told us he'd been making pretty slow time on 395. We wished him luck. Meanwhile, in the very tiny town, Morley was nowhere to be seen. What's he doing, waking up some proprietor in his bed back there? Finally, Morley came back and said there was nothing available, and the only thing to do was to borrow a couple of blankets at the Lake Lodge. We got in the car, went back down the highway a few hundred yards, and turned south toward the glittering trackless snows high in the blue air. We drove along beautiful twin lakes and came to the Lake Lodge, which was a big white frame house inn. Morley went in and deposited five dollars for the use of two blankets for one night. A woman was uh, standing in the doorway, arms akimbo, dogs barked. The road was dusty, a dirt road, but the lake was cerulean blue. In it, the reflections of the cliffs and the foothills showed perfectly. But the road was being repaired, and we could see yellow dust boiling up ahead, where we'd have to walk along the lake road a while before cutting across the creek at the end of the lake, and up through the underbrush, and up the beginning of the trail. We parked the car and got all our gear out and arranged it in the warm sun. Jafey put things in my knapsack and told me I had to carry it or jump in the lake. He was being very serious and leaderly, and it was pleased me more than anything else. Then, with the same boyish gravity, he went over to the dust of the road with a pickaxe and drew a big circle and began drawing things in the circle. What's that? I'm doing a magic mandala. That'll not only help us on our climb, but after a few more marks and chants, I'll be able to predict the future from it. What's a mandala? They're the Buddhist designs that, always, that are always circles filled with things. The circle represents the void and the things illusion, see? You sometimes see mandalas painted over a bodhisattva's head and you can tell the story from studying it. Tibetan in origin. I had on the tennis sneakers and now I whipped out my mountain climbing cap for the day, which Jafi had consigned to me, which was a little black French beret which I put on at a jaunty angle and hitched the knapsack up and was ready to go. In the sneakers and the beret, I felt more like a bohemian painter than a mountain climber, but Jafey had on his fine big boots and his little green Swiss cap with feather and looked elfin but rugged. I see the picture of him alone in the mountains of that outfit, the vision. It's pure morning in the high, dry Sierras. Far-off clean firs can be seen shadowing the sides of the rocky hills. Further yet, snow-capped pinpoints near the big bushy forms of pines, and there's Jafey in his little cap with a big rucksack on his back, clumping along, but with a flower in his left hand, which is hooked to the strap of the rucksack at his breast. Grass grows out between crowded rocks and boulders. Distant sweeps of scree can be seen making gashes down the sides of the morning. His eyes shine with joy. He's on his way. His heroes are John Muir and Han Shan and Shiate and Lee Po, John Burroughs, and Paul Bunyan, and Kropotkin. He's small and has a funny kind of belly coming out as he strides, but it's not because its belly is big, it's because his spine curves a bit, but that's offset by the vigorous long steps he takes, actually the long steps of a tall man, as I found out following him up trail, and his chest is deep and shoulders broad. Go, oh, dang it, Jafey, I feel great this morning. I said as we locked the car and all three of us started swinging down the lake road with their packs, straggling a bit, occupying side and center, the other side of the road like straggling infantrymen. Isn't this a hell of a lot greater than the place? Getting drunk in there on a fresh Saturday morning like this, all blurry and sick. And here we are by the fresh, pure lake, walking along in this good air. By God, it's a haiku in itself. Comparisons are odious, Smith. He sent sailing back to me, quoting Cervantes and making his end Buddhist observation to boot. It don't make a damn freaking difference whether you're in the place or hiking up Matterhorn. It's all the same old void, boy. And I'm used about that, and I realized it was right. Comparisons are odious. It's all the same, but it sure felt great, and suddenly I realized this, in spite of my swollen foot veins. And I realized this would do me a lot of good and gave me a and get me away from drinking, and maybe make me appreciate, perhaps, a whole new way of living. Jafey, I'm glad I met you. I'm going to learn all about how to pack rucksacks and what to do and hide in these mountains when I'm sick of civilization. 
In fact, I'm grateful I met you. Will Smith, I'm grateful I met you too. Learning, how, learning about how to write spontaneously and all that. Oh, that's nothing. To me, it's a lot. Let's go, boys, a little faster. We ain't got no time to waste. By and by, we reached the boiling yellow dust where caterpillars were churning around and great big fat sweaty operators who didn't even look at us were swearing and cussing on the job. For them to climb a mountain, you'd have to pay them double time and quadruple time today is Saturday. Jafe and I laughed to think of it. I felt a little embarrassed with my silly bray, but the cat operators didn't even look and soon we left them behind and were approaching the final little store lodge at the foot of the trail. A log cabin set right on the end of the lake and it was enclosed in a V of pretty big foothills. Here we stopped and rested a while on the steps and we'd hiked approximately four miles but on flat good road and went in and bought candy and crackers and cokes and stuff and then suddenly Morley, who had been silent on the four mile hike and looked funny in his own outfit, which was that immense packboard with air mattress and all deflated now, no hat at all, so that he looked just like he does in the library but with big floppy pants of some kind. Morley suddenly remembered he had forgot to drain the crankcase. So he forgot to drain the crankcase, I said, noticing their consternation and not knowing much about cars. So he forgot to drain the drink case, the drink base. No, this means that if it gets below freezing tonight, down here the goddamn radiator explodes and we can't drive back home and have to, we have to walk 12 miles to Bridgeport and all and get all hung up. Maybe it won't be so cold tonight. Can't take a chance, said Morley. And by that time, I was pretty mad at him for finding more ways that he could figure to forget, foul up, disturb, delay, and make go around in circles this relatively simple hiking trip we had undertaken. What you gonna do? What we gonna do? Walk back four miles? Only thing to do. I'll walk back alone, drain the train case, walk back and follow you up the trail and meet you tonight at the camp. And I'll light a big bonfire, said Jafey, and you'll see the glow and just yodel and we'll direct you in. Well, that's simple. I will. I'll start back right now. But then I felt sorry about poor old hapless funny Henry and said, Oh hell, you mean you're not going to climb with us today? The hell with the crankcase. Come on with us. It'd cost too much money if that thing froze tonight, Smith. No, think. No, I think I better go back. I got plenty of nice thoughts to keep me acquainted with. Probably what you two will be talking about all day. And oh hell, I'll just start back right now. Be sure not to roar at bees. Don't hurt the cart. Don't hurt the cur, and if the tennis party comes on with everybody shirtless, don't make eyes in the searchlight, or the sun will kick a girl's ass right back at your cats and all the boxes of fruit and oranges thrown in, and some such statement. And with no ado or ceremony, there he went, down the road with just a little hand wave, muttering and talking on to himself, so he had to yell, Well, so long, Henry! Hurry up! And he didn't answer, but just walked off shrugging. You know, I said, I think it doesn't make any difference to him anyway. He just He's just satisfied to wander around and forget things. And pat his belly and look at things as they are, sort of like in Shang Tzu. And Jafe and I had a good laugh watching forlorn Henry swaggering down all that road we'd only just negotiated alone and mad. Well, here we go, said Jafe. When I get tired of this big rucksack, we'll swap. I'm ready now. Man, come on, give it to me now. I feel like carrying something heavy. You don't realize how good I feel, feel right now, man. Come on. So we swapped packs and started off. Both of us were feeling fine and were talking a blue streak about anything. Literature, mountains, girls, princes, the poets, Japan, our past adventures in life. And I suddenly realized it was kind of a blessing in disguise. Morley had forgotten to drain the crankcase. Otherwise, JP wouldn't have gotten in a word edgewise all the blessed day. And now I had a chance to hear his ideas. And the way he did things, hiking, he reminded me of Mike, my boyhood chum, who also loved to lead the way, real grave like Buck Jones, eyes to the distant horizons, like Natty Bumpno, cautioning me about snapping twigs, or, it's too steep here, let's go down the creek a ways to ford it, or, there'll be mud in that low bottom, we better skirt around, and dead serious and glad. I saw all Jafey's boyhood in those eastern Oregon forests, the way he went about it. He walked like he talked, from behind I could see his toes, pointed slightly inward, the way mine do, instead of out. But when it came time to climb, he pointed his toes out, like Charlie Chaplin, to make a kind of easier flap the whap as he trudges. We went across the kind of muddy river bottom through dense undergrowth and a few willow trees and 
came out on the other side a little wet, started up the trail, which was clearly marked and named. It had been recently repaired by trail crews, but as we hit parts where a rock had rolled on the trail, he took great precaution to throw the rock off, saying, I used to work on trail crews. I can't see a trail all meddlesome like that, Smith. As we climbed, the lake began to appear below us, and suddenly in its clear blue pool, we could see the deep holes where the lake had its springs, like black wells, and we could see schools of fish skittering. Oh, this is like an early morning in China, and I'm five years old and beginningless time, I sang out and felt like sitting by the trail and whipping out my little notebook and writing sketches about it. Look over there, sang Jaffe. Yellow aspens just put me in the mind of a haiku. Talking about the literary life, the yellow aspens. Walking in this country, you could understand the perfect gems of haikus the Oriental poets had written never getting drunk in the mountains or anything, but just going along as fresh as children, writing down what they saw without literary devices or fanciness of expression. We made up haikus as we climbed, winding up and up now on the slopes of brush. Rocks on the side of the cliff, I said. Why don't they tumble down? Maybe that's a haiku, maybe not. It might be a little too complicated, said Jaffe. A real haiku's got to be as simple as porridge and yet make you see the real thing. Like the greatest haiku of them all probably is the one that goes, This sparrow hops along the veranda with wet feet. By Shiki. You see the wet footprints like a vision in your mind, and yet in those few words you almost see all the rain that's been falling that day and almost smell the wet pine needles. Let's have another. I'll make up one of my own this time. Let's see. Lake below, the black holes the whales make. No, that's not a haiku, goddammit. That never can be too, you never can be too careful about haiku. How about making them up real fast as you go along spontaneously? Look here, he cried happily. Mountain lupines. See the delicate blue color those little flowers have? There's some California red poppy over there. The whole meadow is just powdered with color. Up there by the way is a genuine California white pine. You never see them much anymore. You sure know a lot about birds and trees and stuff. I've studied it all my life. Then also as we went on climbing, we began getting more casual and making funnier, sillier talk. And pretty soon we got to a bend in the trail where it was suddenly glady and dark with shade and tremendous cataract streams with bashing and frothing over scummy rocks and tumbling on down and over the stream was a perfect bridge formed by a fallen snag. We got on it, lay belly down and dunked our heads down, hair wet, Drink deep as the water splashed on our faces, still sticking your hair, still like sticking your head by the jet of a dam. I lay there a good long minute, enjoying the sudden coolness. This is like an advertisement for rainy or ill, yelled Jaffe. Let's sit a while and enjoy it, I said. Boy, you don't get tired. Boy, you don't know how far we got to go yet. I'm not tired. Well, you'll be, tiger. Chapter 9 We went on and I was immensely pleased with the way the trail had a kind of immortal look to it. In the early afternoon now, the way the side of the grassy hill seemed to be clouded with ancient gold dust and the bugs flipped over rocks and the wind sighed in shimmering dances over the hot rocks. And the way the trail would suddenly come into a cool shady part with big trees overhead and hear the light deeper. And the way the lake below us soon became a toy lake with those black well holes perfectly visible still and the giant cloud shadows on the mount on the lake, and the tragic little road winding away where poor Morley was walking back. Can you see Morrill down back there? Jaffe took a long look. I see a little cloud of dust. Maybe that's him coming back already. But it seemed that I had been but it seemed that I had seen the ancient afternoon of that trail from Meadow rocks and lupine posies to sudden revisits with the roaring stream with its splashed snag bridges and undersea greenness there were there was something inexpressibly broken in my heart as though I had lived before and walked this trail under similar circumstances with a fellow bodhisatt with a fellow bodhisattva, but maybe on a more important journey. I felt like lying down by the side of the trail and remembering it all. The woods do that to you. They always look familiar, long lost, like the face of a long dead relative, like an old dream, 
like a piece of forgotten song drifting across the water. Most of all, like golden eternities of past childhood or past manhood and all the living and the dying and the heartbreak that went on a million years ago. And the clouds as they pass overhead seem to testify by their own lonesome familiarity to this feeling. Ecstasy, even, I felt, with flashes of sudden remembrance and feeling sweaty and drowsy, I felt like sleeping and dreaming in the grass. As we got higher, we got more tired, and now, like two true mountain climbers, we weren't talking anymore and didn't have to talk, and were glad. In fact, Jaffe mentioned that, turning to me after a half-hour silence. This is the way I like it. When you, when you get going, there's just no need to talk, as if we were animals and just communicated by silent telepathy. So huddled in our own thoughts, we tromped on, Jaffe using that Gazatsky trudge I mentioned and myself finding my own true step, which was short steps slowly, patiently going up the mountain one mile an hour. So I was always 30 yards behind him, and when we had any high cues now, we had yelled them fore and aft. Pretty soon we got to the top of the part of the trail that was a trail no more, to the incomparable dreamy meadow, which had a beautiful pond, and after that it was boulders and nothing but boulders. Only sign we have now to know which way we're going is ducks. What ducks? See those boulders over there? See those boulders over there? Well, God, man, I see five miles of boulders leading up to that mountain. No, see the little pile of rocks on that near boulder where, there by the pine? That's a duck put up by other climbers. Maybe that's one I put up myself in 54. I'm not sure. We just go from boulder to boulder from now on, keeping a sharp eye for sharp eye for ducks. Then we get a general idea how to raggle along. Although, of course, we know which way we're going. That big cliff face up there is where our plateau is. Plateau? My god, you mean that ain't the top of the mountain? Of course not. After that, we got a plateau and then scree and then more rocks and we get to a final alpine lake, no bigger than this pond. And then comes the final climb over 1,000 feet, almost straight up, boy, to the top of the world, where you'll see all California and parts of Nevada, and the wind will blow right through your pants. How? How long does it all take? Well, the only thing we can expect to make tonight is our camp up there on the plateau. I call it a plateau. It ain't that at all. It's a shelf between heights. By the top and the end of the trail was such a beautiful spot, I said, boy, look at this. A dreamy meadow, pines at one end, the pond, the clear, fresh air, the afternoon clouds rushing golden. Why don't we just sleep here tonight? I don't think I've ever seen a more beautiful park. Ah, oh, this is nowhere. It's great, of course, but we might wake up tomorrow morning, he said, and find three dozen school teachers on horseback frying bacon in, bacon in our backyard. When we're going, you can bet your ass there won't be one. Where we're going, you can bet your ass there won't be one human being. And if there is, I'll be a spotted horse's ass, or maybe just one mountain climber or two, but I don't expect so at this time of the year. You know, the snow's about to come here any time now. If it comes tonight, it's goodbye me and you. Well, goodbye, Jaffe, but let's rest here and drink some water and admire the meadow. We were feeling tired and great, and we spread out in the grass and rested in swap packs and strapped them on and were raring to go. Almost instantaneously, the grass ended and the boulders started. We got up on the first one, and from that point on, it was just a matter of jumping from boulder to boulder, gradually climbing, climbing five miles up a valley of boulders, getting steeper and steeper with immense crags on both sides, forming the walls of the valley, till near the cliff face we'd be, we'd be scrambling up the boulders, it seemed. And what's behind that cliff face? Well, there's high grass up there, shrubbery, scattered boulders, beautiful meandering creeks that have ice in them, even in the afternoon, spots of snow, tremendous trees, and one boulder just about as big as two of Alva's cottages piled on top of the other, which leans over and makes a kind of concave cave for us to camp at. Lighting a big bonfire there will throw heat against the wall. Then after, the, then after that, the grass and the timber ends. That'll be at 9,000, just about. With my sneakers, it was, an easy, it was as easy as pie to just dance nimbly from boulder to boulder, but... After a while, I noticed how gracefully Jaffe was doing it, and he just ambled from boulder to boulder, some, sometimes in a deliberate dance with his legs crossing from right to left, 
right to left, and for a while I followed his every step, but then I learned it was better for me to just spontaneously pick my own boulders and make a ragged dance of my own. The secret of this kind of climbing, said Jaffe, is like Zen. Don't think, just dance along. It's the easiest thing in the world. Actually easier than walking on flat ground, which is monotonous. The cute little problems present themselves at each step, and yet you never hesitate, and you find yourself on some other boulder you picked out for no special reason at all, just like Zen, which it was. We didn't talk much now. We got tiresome on the leg muscles. We spent hours, about three, going up that long, long valley. At that time it grew to late afternoon, and the light was growing amber, and shadows were falling ominously in the valley of dry boulders, and instead, though, of making you feel scared, it gave you that immortal feeling again. The ducks were all laid out, easy to see. On top of a boulder, you'd stand and look about and spot a duck, usually only two flat rocks on top of each other, maybe with one round on top for decoration. And you aimed in that general direction. The purpose of these ducks, as laid out by all previous climbers, was to save a mile or two of wandering around in the immense valley. Meanwhile, our roaring creek was still at it, but thinner and more quiet now running from the cliff face itself a mile up the valley in a big black stain I could see in the gray rock. Jumping from boulder to boulder and never falling with a heavy pack is easier than it sounds. You just can't fall when you get into the rhythm of the dance. I looked back down the valley sometimes and was surprised to see how high we'd come and to see farther horizons of mountains now back there. Our beautiful trail top park was a little like a was like a little glen of the forest of Arden. Then the climbing got steeper, and the sun got redder, and pretty soon I began to see patches of snow with the shade of some rocks. We got up to where the cliff face seemed to loom over us, and at one point I saw Jaffe throw down his pack and danced my way up to him. Well, this is where we'll drop our gear and climb those few hundred feet up the side of that cliff. Where you see there's it's shallower, and we'll find that camp. I remember it. In fact, you can sit here and rest... Or beat your bishop while I go rambling up there, and I like to ramble up by myself. Okay. So I sat down and changed my wet socks and changed soaking undershirt for dry one, and cro crossed my legs and rested and whistled for about a half hour. A very pleasant occupation. And Jaffe got back and said he'd found the camp. I thought it would be a little jaunt to our resting place, but it took almost another hour to jump up the steep boulders climb around some, get to the level of the cliff face plateau, and there on flat grass, more or less, hike about 200 yards to where a huge gray rock towered among pines. Here now the earth was a splendorous thing, snow on the ground and melting patches in the grass, gurgling creeks and the huge silent rock mountains on both sides, and a wind blowing, the smell of heather. We forded a lovely little creek, shallow as your hand, pearl pure lucid water, and got to the huge rock. Here were old charred logs where other mountain climbers had camped. And where's Matterhorn Mountain? You can't see it from here, but pointing up the further long plateau in a scree gorge, twisting to the right. Around that draw and up two miles or so, then we'll be at the foot of it. Wow, heck woo, that'll take us a whole other day. Not when you're traveling with me, Smith. Well, ridery, that's okay with me. Okay, Smithy, now how about we relax and enjoy ourselves and cook up some supper and wait for old Morley? So we unpacked our packs and laid things out and smoked and had a good time. Now the mountains were getting that pink tinge. I mean the rocks. They were just solid rock covered with the atoms of dust accumulated there since beginningless time. In fact, I was afraid of those jagged monstrosities all around and over our heads. They're so silent, I said. Yeah, man, you know, to me, a mountain is a Buddha. Think of the patience, hundreds of thousands of years just sitting there, being perfectly, perfectly silent and like praying for all living creatures in that silence and just waiting for us to stop all our fretting and fooling. Chafee got out the tea, Chinese tea, and sprinkled some in a tin pot. Had the fire going meanwhile, a small one to begin with. The sun was still on us and stuck a long stick tight down under a few big rocks and made himself something to hang the teapot on, and pretty soon the water was boiling and he poured it out, steaming into the tin pot, and we had cups of tea with our tin cups. I myself had gotten the water from the stream, which was cold and pure like snow, and the crystal lidded eyes of heaven. Therefore the tea was by far the most pure and thirst-quenching tea I ever drank 
in all my life. It made you want to drink more and more, and it actually quenched your thirst, and of course it swam around hot in your belly. Now you understand the oriental passion for tea, said Jaffe. Remember that book I told you about? The first sip is joy, the second is gladness, the third is serenity, the fourth is madness, the fifth is ecstasy. It's just a bell, old buddy, I said. That rock we were camped against was a marvel. It was 30 feet high and 30 feet at base. A perfect square almost, and twisted trees arched over it, peeked down on us. From the base it went outward, forming a concave, so if rain came we'd be partially covered. How did this immense son of a bitch ever get here? It's probably left here by the retreating glacier, he said. See over there, that field of snow? Yeah. That's the, that's the glacier, what's left of it. Either that or this rock tumbled here from inconceivable prehistoric mountains we can't understand, or maybe it just landed here when the friggin' mountain range itself busted up out of the ground in the Jurassic upheaval. Ray, when you're up here, you're not sitting in the Berkeley Tea Room. This is the beginning and the end of the world, right here. Look at all those patient Buddhas looking at us saying nothing. And you come out here by yourself? For weeks on end. Just like John Muir, climb around all by myself, falling quartzite veins or making posies of flowers for my camp, or just walking around naked and singing, cook my supper and laugh. Jaffe, I gotta hand it to you. You're the happiest little cat in the world, and the greatest by God you are. I'm sure glad I'm learning all this. This place makes me feel devoted too. I mean, you, you know I have a prayer, but did you know the prayer I use? What? Well, I sit down and say, and I run all my friends and relatives and enemies one by one in this without entertaining any angers or gratitudes or anything, and I say, like, Jaffe Ryder, equally empty, equally to be loved, equally a coming Buddha. Then I run on, say to, to David O. Selznick, equally empty, equally to be loved, equally a coming Buddha. Although I don't use names like David O. Selznick, just, just people I know because when I say the words equally a coming Buddha, I want to be thinking of their eyes like... Like you take Morley, his blue eyes behind those glasses. When you think equally a coming Buddha, you think of those eyes, and you really do s suddenly see the true secret serenity and the truth of his coming Buddhahood. Then you think of your, your enemy's eyes. That's great, Ray. And Jaffe took out his notebook and wrote down the prayer and shook his head in wonder. That's really, really great. I'm going to teach this prayer to the monks I meet in Japan. There's nothing wrong with you, Ray. Your only trouble is you never learned to get out to spots like this. You let the world drown you in its horse shit, and you've been vexed. Though, as I say, comparisons are odious. But what we're saying now is true. He took his bulgur rough cracked wheat and dumped a couple of packages of dried vegetables in and put it all in the pot to be ready to be boiled at dusk. We began listening for the yodels of Henry Morley, which didn't come. We began to worry about him. The trouble about all this, damn it, if he fell off a boulder and broke his leg, there'd be no one to help him. It's dangerous, too. I do it all, myself. I do it all by myself, but I'm pretty good. I'm a, I'm a mountain goat. I'm getting hungry, I said. Me too, damn it. I, w I, I wish he gets here soon. Let's ramble around and eat snowballs and drink water and wait. We did this, investigating the upper end of the flat plateau and came back. By now the sun was gone behind the western wall of our valley, and it was getting darker, pinker, colder. More hues of purple began to steal across the jags. The sky was deep. We even began to see pale stars, at least one or two. Suddenly we heard a distant yodel lady And Jaffe leaped up. Jaffe le leaped up and jumped to the top of a boulder and yelled, Hoo, hoo, hoo! And the yodel lady who came back, How far is he? <clears throat> My God, from the sound of it, he's, he's not even started. <laughs> he's not even at the beginning of the Valley of Boulders. He, he can never make it tonight. What do we do? Let's go to the rock cliff and sit on the edge and call him an hour. And call him an hour. Let's bring these peanuts and raisins and munch on him and wait. Maybe he's not so far as I think. 
we went over to the promontory where we could see the whole valley, and Jafie sat down on full lotus posture, cross-legged on a rock, and took out his wooded juju prayer beads and prayed. That is, he simply held the beads in his hand, the hands upside down with thumbs touching, and stared straight ahead and didn't move a bone. I sat down as best I could on another, on another rock, and we both said nothing and meditated. Only I meditated with my eyes closed. The silence was an intense roar. From where we were, the sound of the creek, the gurgle and slapping talk of the creek, was blocked off by rocks. We heard several more melancholy yodel lady hoos and answered them, but it seemed further and further away each time. When I opened my eyes, the pink was more purple all the time. The stars began to flash. I fell into deep meditation. I felt that the mountains were indeed Buddhas and our friends. I felt the weird sensation that it was strange that there were only three men in this whole immense valley. The mystic number three. Nert... Nirmanakaya, Sambhokakaya, and Dharmakaya. I prayed for the safety and, in fact, the eternal happiness of poor Morley. Once I opened my eyes and saw Jaffe sitting there rigid as a rock and felt like laughing. He looked so funny. But the mountains were mighty solemn, and so was Jaffe, and for that matter, so was I. And, in fact, laughter is solemn. It was beautiful. The pinkness vanished, and then it was all purple dusk, and the roar of the silence was like a wash of diamond waves going through the liquid porches of our ears, enough to soothe a man a thousand years. I prayed for Jaffe, for his future safety and happiness and eventual Buddhahood. It was all completely serious, all completely hallucinated, all completely happy. Rocks are space, I thought, and space is illusion. I had a million thoughts. Jaffe had his. I was amazed at the way he meditated with his eyes open, and I was mostly humanly amazed at this tremendously little guy who eagerly studied Oriental poetry and anthropology and ornithology and everything else in his books was a tough little adventurer of trails and mountains, should also suddenly whip out his pitiful, beautiful wooden prayer beads and solemnly pray like that, like an old-fashioned saint of the desert, certainly. It's so amazing to see it in America with its steel mills and airfields. The world ain't so bad when you got Jaff Jaffe's, I thought, and felt glad. All the aching muscles and the hunger in my belly were bad enough, and the surrounded dark rocks, the fact that there is nothing there to see thee with kisses and soft words, but just to be sitting there meditating and praying for the world with another earnest young man, for good enough to have been born just to die as we all were. Something will come of it in the milky ways of eternity, stretching in front of all our phantom, unchaundiced eyes, friends. I felt like telling Jaffe everything I thought, but I knew it didn't matter, and moreover, he knew it anyway, and silence is the golden mountain. Yoda lady, sang Morley, and now it was dark, and Jaffe said, well, from the looks of it, things, he's still far away. He has enough sense to pitch his own camp down there tonight, so let's go back to our camp and cook supper. Okay. And we yelled, whoo, a couple of times reassuringly and gave up poor Moral for the night. And He did have enough sense, we knew. As it turned out, he did. He pitched his camp, wrapped up in his two blankets on top of the air mattress, and slept the night out in that incomparably happy meadow with the pond and the pines, telling us about it when he finally reached, reached us the next day. <laughs>